Let me share a few things about my experience with God um, with in prayer. Okay, so basically, um, I got saved in 1994. And um, when I got saved, I got filled with the Spirit the same day. And that really changed my life. That changed the game for me. But I had a problem. I had a problem because I didn't have um, a mentor. As I had a problem with, you know, really accepting that I was really filled with the Spirit, really accepting that um, this is real. Because I just couldn't believe that. How can I get filled with the Spirit? How can I get born again and then get filled with the Spirit? But you know what? I met someone about a, a week after and um, a friend's uncle, and he was telling me about how he got filled with the Spirit and he started speaking in tongues. And all he could say was one syllable, ba 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 kind of things. I said, okay, you know what, devil? Whatever. Even if this is not good, I'm just going to speak it. And that's how I started speaking in tongues. Now, I had a second hurdle. It's as if once, God, once the devil knows that he can't hide anymore, once he knows you know the truth, then he kind of leaves you on that area. So the second thing was, um, I got to that point again where, where I couldn't pray for a long time. You know, I could pray in tongues. The devil couldn't lie to me anymore that I couldn't pray in tongues. But the problem was, I couldn't pray for a long time. I couldn't pray for hours. I mean, not even hours. I couldn't pray for minutes. I couldn't pray for more than five, ten minutes. I'll be tired. And so I struggled and tried. And I got to that point where I said, you know what, God, just give me a husband. Whenever I get married, just give me a husband that can pray so that he will pray for both of us while I sleep. He would pray. Hey, good equation. And, you know, I got I got to OAU and I met my pastor. I met my company and that made a world of difference. I remember the day I prayed for one hour for the very first time that 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 was a game changer for me because I I got filled with the spirit. So I I prayed one hour and then I told the devil again, the devil. So you've been hiding this thing from me. I thought I couldn't pray. You lied to me. Prayer was not my thing. And, um, you know, I said, the next time you tell me I can't do anything in the kingdom, that means you're trying to hide something. I'm going to do it and do double. And so I started praying. So I went from one hour to three hours to four and six and seven and 10 and 12 and, you know, to more than 12 hours at a stretch. And I just started praying and praying. And, you know, that became the foundation of my life, the foundation of my ministry and the foundation of the prayer revival that God has brought, you know, to people around me and to the world at large, I believe. And today I have people, men and women and children and everybody around me praying hours in tongues. I have people around me praying. I mean, I'm not joking. Six, seven, eight hours, ten hours a day. They go to work, but they are make they're, they're putting in the hours. I have people praying 16 hours and 17 hours. Our campus ministry started a 500 hour challenge, meaning in certain number of um, weeks they needed to do 500 hours. So we measure prayer. We set prayer goals. They needed to do 500 hours of prayer. And that brought it to about at least six hours every day. So they started praying six hours. I think I don't remember for how long. Started praying six hours every day. Now in our ministry, we have what we call the growth plan. So I know what everybody's doing spiritually. I see, I may not see in details everybody, but somebody knows what somebody's doing. And, you know, because we, we operate what we call the growth plan. And, um, you know, I see people come on board, come close to this anointing and they begin to pray 12 hours. They're just empowered to pray. All right. And, um, almost a year ago, we started a ridiculous project. It's called 24 hours project for the next 10 years. Meaning, um, as we are now prayers going on, like, it just goes on 24 hours, Monday to Friday. And what are we praying for? We're praying for the move of God's spirit. We're praying for revival. 
We're praying for laborers to be raised. We're praying for people like you to find your prayer power, to find your callings, to find your ministries, to find your destinies. We're praying for men to arise and women to arise in the kingdoms, in the kingdom of God. We're praying for the unreached people to be reached with the gospel. We're praying Habakkuk 2.14 that the knowledge of the glory of God should cover the earth as waters cover the seas. We're praying for the outpouring of God's spirit. We're praying that you see that God's word will have free course in our generation and that revival will be birth. And I believe in this training we're having tonight, I believe that same anointing and that same impartation would rest upon you in such a way that you see it's an impartation and I need you to be open. I need your hearts to be open. One thing that I've seen over and over and over again is when I hang out with people, that same prayer anointing comes upon them and they are empowered to pray and the desire to pray comes upon them and the passion for prayer and the passion for greater intimacy and greater depth with God comes upon them. They begin to thirst and hunger for more and more and more of God until their spiritual lives take a whole new level. And I believe that's what's going to happen to you through this training. So shall we just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you. Holy Spirit, I, I welcome your manifest presence here. I thank you for impartations of your spirit. I ask, oh God, for a mighty outpouring and a move of your spirit in this place. I pray for a mighty outpouring of your spirit in us, in our lives, in our spirits. Let there be a new move of your spirit in us, O oh God. Holy Spirit, the Bible says, out of our belly shall flow rivers of living waters. I ask in the name of Jesus, let the gifts, let the potentials, let the resources of God within your precious daughters, let them be stirred up in the name of Jesus. Let them be awakened in the name of Jesus. I pray, oh God, for, for, for grace, oh God, grace to pray. Let the same spirit of prayer invade the hearts and the lives of your precious people. In the name of Jesus, let the same spirit of prayer that has raised many all over the world, let it rest upon them. Let it rest every, let it raise everyone here and everyone that will yet listen to this audio or video or whatever. Let it rest upon everyone that comes in contact with this material. Lord, that laborers be raised for your mighty move upon the earth. That laborers in the gospel might be raised and that they may be thrust out into the massive, vast harvest that is overripe all around the world in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. So you're welcome. And um, we'll just get straight into the word. Um, I believe I have about um, how many minutes and then questions. I know 20 minutes questions. How many minutes do I have to speak? I think, um, pardon? 70 minutes. All right, 70 minutes. That's one hour, 10 minutes. Okay. All right. So I'll be speaking on harnessing the power of prayer, harnessing the power of prayer. Write as fast as you can because I have so much to say. I will not be able to say everything that I have in this manual. I could pass the manual over to you later, um, but I'll try to do as much as possible. I want to lay foundation before I move into praying in the spirit. I want to lay foundation, first of all, of uh, a foundation of why prayer, what prayer is all about and, um, you know, and um, confidence, building confidence, the assurance that we have in prayer, and then we move to praying in tongues. So the objective is here to help you understand the ability you have in prayer. Number two, to help you understand the power of praying in tongues, to help you understand the benefits of praying in tongues, to help you understand the power of praying long hours in the spirit, and to empower you to pray long hours in the spirit. And so I want to start by saying why do we pray? Why do we pray? Because if you don't understand the purpose of a thing, abuse is inevitable. All right. If you don't understand why we pray. Now, many people think um, prayer is just a two-way communication between man and God. 
You know, it's also known to be a primary way by which we ask God for things. After all, we quote the scripture that says, ask and it shall be given. Ask that you joy might may be full. All right. So we basically assume prayer is a platform for asking or begging. You know, begging God. God, you know, if I were you, I would do this. So, you know, why are you not doing this for me? You know, if I were to be in your shoes, I would do this for you. And it goes on and on. All right. However, prayer is much more than those. And the, you see, if you don't understand the power of prayer, your prayer life will never go beyond, you know, the mundane. Will never go beyond, you know, we're just praying a little here. You know, just, you know, people would ask me, why you pray long hours? Do you have problems? Like, do you really, really have problems? Like, are your problems that big? I remember in school, I mean, I literally, I went to um, OA, your Bafema Law University, and I would literally spend nights and nights and nights praying and just praying in the spirit and just praying in the spirit and just praying in the spirit. And people would wonder, you know, and the amazing thing was you wouldn't really find men there. You wouldn't really find women there praying. You know, because uh, why pray, you know, but prayer is much more than that. Prayer is a platform for empowerment. Prayer is a platform for empowerment. Prayer is a platform for fellowship. Prayer is how we fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Prayer is a platform for empowerment. All right, it is a covenant route for connecting and engaging with the supernatural. It is the primary, it's a covenant route, the, some call it route, but I call it route, the covenant route for connecting and engaging the supernatural. All of God's ability in man is activated through prayer. You need to get this. All of God's ability in man is activated through prayer. Meaning there is no, there's hardly any other way that God's abilities inside of you can be activated. All right. Especially when done right. Especially when done right. So why do we pray? We pray because God can do nothing on the earth except somebody prays. We pray because God is not a magician. God has given us the authority in Genesis 1, 26. Says, Let us make man in our image, out our likeness. Let him have dominion. Verse 28 says, and then he blessed them. And he said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, have dominion. The Bible says the heavens and the heavens alone belong to the Lord, but the earth has he given to the children of men. Psalm 115 verse 16. It says the heavens and the heavens alone belong to the Lord, but the earth has he given to the sons of men. Meaning we are in charge of God's earth. We are in charge of the realm of the earth. God can do nothing except we allow him. And that's the primary reason we pray. We pray to engage the supernatural. We pray to permit God to move upon the earth. We pray to release the power of God upon the earth. Glory to God. You see, man is a spirit. He lives in a body. In, he lives in a body and he has a soul. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23. And I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so man is a spirit. You see, this is the foundation of our Christian faith. If you don't understand this statement I just made, I'm telling you, you're going to have a lot of issues having revelations in God's word. That man is a spirit, he has a soul, and he lives in a body. Man is not a spirit, soul, and body. Man is a spirit. He has a soul and he lives in a body. 
Now listen, with the spirit, man contacts God in the spirit realm. It's only through the spirit that man can contact God. The Bible says in John chapter four, verse 24, it says, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him. How? In the spirit, in spirit and in truth. So God is a spirit and only through the spirit can we contact God. You can't contact God through your body or your emotions. And so in prayer, you see, in prayer, uh, we don't contact God through our emotions. Oh, God, 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 you know what I'm going through, God, you know, and then we cry and, you know, we do all those naked prayers. You know what I mean? You know, when you pray naked, then God, you're going to get God's attention. You're not getting God's attention more than when you have a winter jacket on. So whether you're naked or you're you are totally cladded up in winter jacket and winter everything or hijab or whatever. You're not going to get God's attention more. The Bible says he's a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So with the spirit, man contacts the realm of the spirit. With the soul, man contacts the emotional and intellectual realm. That's where the reasoning happens. The soul consists of three major compartments, which is not the, the topic of our, the focus of our teaching today, but just for information's sake. The soul consists of the mind, the will, and the emotion. The mind, the will, and the emotion. Through the emotion, we contact the emotional realm. Through the mind, we contact the intellectual realm. Through the will, we contact that we make decisions. It's the seat of decision. And that's why a man or a woman who is not spiritual is going to be carnal. Carnality is not flesh. When you say someone is fleshy, or flesh ruled, it's not just the body, it's the state of the soul. That is, this person is carnally minded. His will, his emotion, and his minds have not been renewed by God's word, so that his impulses are natural and not spiritual. While a person who is said to be spiritual. May, the impulse, that means this person is inspired by the word and the impulses of this person is based on the word. All right. And so an unrenewed mind is a very dangerous mind, a dangerous person, even though he's born again, but he needs to renew his mind. He needs to be transformed according to Romans chapter 12, verse two, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good because a man with an unrenewed mind cannot please God because he cannot be in agreement with God. So that pleasing according to Hebrews 12 it's not verse six. It's not talking about, oh, God is not happy with me. That is, you cannot be in agreement with God if you are in the flesh. That's what the Greek word means. You can't be in agreement with God because you're not in the flesh. And Amos says, can two be agreed? Can two walk together if they're not, if they're not agreed? All right. So if it's the body that gives us, that gives a person the right to operate on earth because it's like a divine passport. And that's why it's appointed for a man to die once after that judgment. You don't come back. There's no abiku, there's no reincarnation of a man. Once you die, that's judgment. It's over. That's the end. We can't come back and make things happen again. All right? So you see, when a person dies, when a person's body dies, that person is disqualified from operating on this earth. So somebody's spirit can never come back. Once a person dies straight out of, of, of this earth to, to heaven's gate or to hell. Do you understand? And that's why, that's the sole reason 
why God cannot operate on this earth without a body. The same way the devil, you know, we've given so much kudos to the devil, like the devil just does, he can't operate without a, without a body. And that's what the Bible said, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. That your husband is not the enemy. Your mother-in-law is not the enemy. Um, your neighbor, the woman in the village is not the enemy. The devil is the, is, the, is the enemy. But the devil can manifest through people. And without people, the devil himself cannot manifest. As well as God cannot manifest without people. And that's why there's always a constant battle between vessels. Because God wants this vessel. The devil wants the vessel. And so when believers don't yield themselves to mission. Don't yield themselves. God can do nothing upon this earth. Except we yield ourselves to him. That's the power that God has given humanity. That we have power with God. We carry this power in earthen vessels. That the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We've got to permit God. Prayer is permitting God to do what he wants to do. Prayer is permitting God to move upon the earth. To bring revival. For souls to be won. For revival to happen. All right. God cannot move in a home. Cannot move in a family. Cannot move in a community. In a nation. In a continent. In the world. In a generation. Except prayer people arise. John Wesley said, it seems God will not do anything for humanity except somebody prays. And so prayer is serious business. Somebody says it is, it's, I think it's John Knox. It said it's, it's, it's more important to learn how to pray than to get a university degree. Now, does it mean a university degree is useless? No. But he's saying as important as it is to get a university degree, it's even more important to learn how to pray. Because you see, a man with a PhD, a man with whatever, listen, can, you know, you can get a good education, but you don't, you can't get wisdom. Except by God. You can get, you can get access to a great, um, to, to, to the best health care, but healing comes from God. You can marry anybody, but a good husband, a good wife comes from God. Do you understand? So God can do nothing on this earth except we pray. And so somebody said, why is there so much chaos? Why is there so much? You say, God, why are these things happening? God is saying, girl, why are these things happening? Like, why are you, why are you permitting these things? So we say, oh God, remember how, how, um, what's his name? How Moses at the, between the Red Sea and the, and the Egyptian army. And then he looked back, the Egyptian army looked for the Red Sea. Then he turned to God and said, God help me. And God said, why are you crying out to me? What's that in your hand? Why are you crying out to me? What's that in your hand? Stretch forth. That's the power that God has given to us as believers. We have the power to say no. We have the Bible said, whatever you bind on earth is automatically bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth is loosed in heaven. It's up to you. Prayer is a covenant platform by which God is allowed to manifest on the earth. All right. God can do nothing on the earth or in our lives except we ask him or invite him through prayer. So what are the basis for answered prayers? How do you know that God answers your prayer? How do you know? You know, I see a lot of believers that don't believe in their ability to, to get answered prayers. They don't believe that God can answer them. So they are looking for a pastor to pray for them. They are looking for a mountain somewhere to go to. They are looking for all of these things. Do you understand? Now in the olden days, you see, Jesus was not in the New Testament. Do you realize that? That the Gospels are actually a part of the Old Testament. They operated because G the New Testament didn't start until Jesus died and resurrected. Do you realize that? The New Testament didn't start until Jesus had died. 
And so Jesus was the go in between, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And there were certain things that Jesus had to do to fulfill the Old Testament so that the New Testament can come forth. And that's why we tell believers, spend most of your time in the New Testament because that's what relates to us and not the Old Testament. Don't conjure and don't go and bring prayer points from the Old Testament. It is old, it is stale, it is fulfilled. So don't go get in prayer points from the Old Testament and you're trying to live as a new creation person. You are a new creation. The old is gone. And the gospels is where our power lies. And you've got to master the gospels and see the Old Testament in the light of the New Testament. But if you don't know what the New Testament says, you're always going to get it all mixed up. And you're going to get certain practices mixed up that are practices of the Old Testament and not of the New Testament. This is the basis of... Of a powerful prayer life. So basically. Um, I want to give us. A, a strong basis. A strong. Um, a strong basis. For answered prayers. I want you to get to that place of prayer. With such confidence. And such power. You know with such. With such confidence that when I pray, God hears me. You see, Jesus prayed and said, Father, thank you because you hear me always. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. Father, what confidence. And yet that's the kind of confidence that God wants us to have as well. God wants us to get to that place where we don't need to run from pillar to post. We don't need to go from mountain to valley looking for somebody to pray for you. You can be confident in your ability to get answered prayers all the time. Right? All the time. And so, um, so many believers are confused and uncertain about God and how effectively they can reach him. All right. Because they don't know him or they don't understand how the kingdom of God operates. So most people don't have faith in the ability to get answered prayers. And that's why a lot of people don't even pray and don't pray long hours because they don't even know. All right. And so I'm going to share with you a few things. And we say, oh, I've prayed. And because I prayed, I didn't get the manifestation. Then God didn't hear me. You know, you need to understand one fact. And that fact is this, that the physical, the material world is subject to the spiritual world. The spiritual world is the parent world of the physical meaning you see things have happened in the realm of the spirit the natural is so slow in catching up with the spiritual realities and so you've received your healing in the realm of the spirit but your body is not manifesting it so the devil tells you god didn't answer you you've prayed and believed god for something and then it's it seems it's not happening And then instantly you're getting discouraged. But you need to understand that when I pray, God hears me. Jesus said, Father, thank you because you hear me always. When we pray, he hears me. And what's the the confidence? What's the confidence? Some of us have this idea that sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says hold on. Sometimes God says maybe. Sometimes God says later. But what does the Bible say in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2? It says, for all the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of God. It didn't say maybe. As long as the word, as long as it's in alignment with God's word. 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence that we have. That if we ask anything according to his will, that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then we know we are assured that we have what we have asked for. This is the confidence that we have. It's all about confidence in the spirit. This is the confidence that we have. Glory to God. 
And so the devil, so the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. We're not moved by what we see. We're not moved by how we feel. We're only moved by the word of God. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse six, we walk by faith and not by sight. So how do I know God has answered my prayer by the way I feel? No, but because God's word says so. So you need to understand that the word of God is the foundation of answered prayers. The word of God and not our feelings, not our emotional, not our emotions, you know, but the word of God is the, that is the confidence that we have. Has the word said it, then I believe it and that settles it. God said it. I believe it and that settles it. I believe whatever the word says I am is what I am. Whatever the word says I have is what I have. Whatever the word says I can do, that's what I can do. I don't care how I feel because I know the natural is slow in catching up with spiritual realities. So God is not angry with us. God will not withhold anything good from you. You know, sometimes, has it happened to you before? At least it has happened to me sometime. You know, uh, where you step out in the day and then things don't go right. And then you say, oh, it's because I didn't pray this morning. How many people have experienced that? Let me see your hands. Like, seriously. Oh, wow. I'm talking to extra guru people here. You guys are super spiritual. You know, <laughs> I'm, then you feel like, ah, oh, it's because I didn't pray. It's because I didn't pray. You need to understand certain things. You need to, that certain things are already settled and established. Don't let the devil lie to you. And we will go there. So let me just go on. Romans chapter 8 verse 32. It says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Listen to me. When you were a stinking dead sinner, God gave you his best. When you were a sinner, God gave you his best. How much more now that you are a son in the house? The same God that causes the rain to fall on both the righteous and the unrighteous. How will he withhold anything good from you? And that's what he says here. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall, he's saying, think about this. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Hebrews 4, 16. It says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Let us come boldly, not with guilt. Romans 8, 1 says, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, not come with guilt, but come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Glory to God. Assurance of answered prayers. Let's see Hebrews chapter 7 verse 20. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 20 to 25, which is the foundation. I'm going to just take three and then go into praying in tongues. I need to move faster. It says Hebrews 7, 20 to 25. And, and in as much as, he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath. But he with an oath, by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because it continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he's able to say to the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So Jesus lives to make intercession for us. Ah. Oh. So let's look at the first um, basis, the first assurance of answered prayers, the, God's word. We've talked about that. So God's word is the assurance of answered prayer because God's word is God's will expressed. Now God doesn't, is not, um, God is not an English man. God is not English. God is not Chinese. 
God is not Igbo. God is not um, Jamaican. And so God doesn't speak all those languages. He only speaks one language. And guess what that language is? The word. So if you speak the word in Chinese, he hears you. If you speak the word in, in Yoruba, he hears you. If you speak the word in Hausa, he hears you. This is the confidence. 1 John 5, 14. If we ask anything according to what? His will. His, his word is his will expressed. Whatever you see in God's word is his will. Whatever you see in God's word is his will. And as long as you find his will, you can go to bed. Mark 4. The kingdom of God is as if a man should cast seed in the ground. Verse 26. And should go to bed and rise night and day and the seed should grow. And he doesn't know how. When you know what the word of God says, you can go to bed on it. All right. Whatever you see in God's word has been ratified. It's been ratified. It's been settled and done. Nothing can be added. Nothing can be subtracted. So the question is never, has God done it? All right. But do you believe that he's done it? Do you believe that he's done it? Do you believe you're already healed? Or are you going to ask and say, God, heal me? That's a wrong kind of prayer. You don't say, God, heal me. You believe he's healed you already. So what do you do? Father, I thank you for my healing. Because the Bible says, by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. So you receive. And that's why, you see, we, we receive from God's word what is already ours. And that's why prayer is not a platform for saying, God, give me, God, give me, and all of that. All right? Number two, the covenant. Hebrews 6, 13, 20. It said, for God, for when God made a, a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, in blessing, surely blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heads of promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. That is God wanting to show you how unchangeable his word is. That if he has said it, it is done. You can go to bed on it. It said um, the, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. And this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, the confidence that we have, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us. Even Jesus having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Number three, the blood. The assurance of answered prayers. Sin separated man from God. No one could approach God as man had lost his right standing before God. Do you understand? No one was righteous. Man was made in the image of God, had the authority of God, but man fell through sin. And after man fell, man lost his righteousness. Man lost his sense of acceptance. Man had what is called sin consciousness. And there's nothing like sin conscience that robs even now believers from the inheritance. All right. So when Adam sinned, man fell. Man lost his right standing before God. But Jesus came. Listen, he didn't come so we can make heaven. We are we already made. If you're born again, you've made heaven. You know, the way we, we go on with this making heaven sometimes can be amazing. Like Jesus came so that we can make heaven. Now, if that was the case, then the day you got born again, you should have gone to heaven. But you see, it's for a believer, the question of making heaven is not because you see, God did not cut a covenant with us. God cut a covenant with Jesus. God never cut, God cut a covenant with the Israelites. 
And so the validity of that covenant was based on the Israelites. And that was why it was an eye for an eye. If you mess up, you die. But you see, we're in a different dispensation that God cut a covenant with Jesus, sacrificed Jesus on the cross so that when we are in Christ, we enter into the covenant that Christ has with God, meaning the validity of the covenant is not in your hands. It's not up to us. I'm saying something because listen to me. The enemy has robbed believers of their conf- of their confidence in prayer because they feel like, oh, you know, let me first of all ask for forgiveness before I pray. Will God answer me? Am I good enough? Am I? People have low self esteem when it comes to their relationship with God. You don't believe you can lay hands on the sick and the sick will be will recover. We don't believe you can pray for someone to get filled with the Spirit because you don't think you're good enough. You're constantly looking for a better believer to help help you constantly looking for a prayer partner because you don't trust that God can answer or hear your prayer. The validity of the covenant is not based on us. It's based on Jesus. And that's why it's not a choice anymore to go to heaven or to go to hell. Once you choose Christ, you are made. Once you choose Christ, you are heaven bound because you are now in Christ and you're leveraging on the price that Jesus already paid. Glory to God. And so Jesus did not come so we can make heaven. Heaven is our final destination. Whoever goes to, goes to work and you're praying, God, please let me be able to go back home today. You don't do that. Your children go to school and then they are praying, oh God, let me be able to go. Let my daddy accept me today. Let me be able to make home. No, it's something you don't think about. So Jesus did not come so we can make heaven. What Jesus came to do is to replace, is to restore man back to that place of fellowship with the spirit of God. That place, he came to restore fellowship between God and man that Adam had lost. So through redemption and by the blood of Jesus, Jesus dealt with the sin problem, dealt with the problem that stood before God and man. So whatever the wall of partition that blocked God from man was brought down in Christ. So now we have access to Christ through our righteousness. Righteousness is the ability to stand before God without a sense of fear, guilt, condemnation, and inferiority. And you know what that means? We stand as Jesus stands before God. Because we don't have a different righteousness. We have the same righteousness that Christ has. That's the same one he gave to you. And we stand before God as Christ stood before him and stands before him. The same way Jesus would say, Lazarus, come forth. We have the same standing, the same ability, the same rights. We have right to the Father to lay hands on the sick and say in the name of Jesus, be healed. And that person will be healed. We have the same righteousness, ability. It's an ability to stand before God without a sense of inferiority. Without that sense of, I'm not good enough. I need the pastor to pray for me. I'm not good enough. I need to go to the mountain. I'm not good enough. I need to go for deliverance. I'm not good enough. You've got to believe in the fact that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I have rights before my father. A child doesn't care if you are the MDC or whatever, or if you are the general of a sea of anything. A child wants to see his mom or his dad. It says mom. And that's why you see all the Jehovah Shekinu, Jehovah this, Jehovah this. In the new covenant, everything was brought together in one word. Abba, Father. In the New Testament, nobody called God Father. They called him Jehovah. In the New Testament, we call him Father. We call him Father because that's who he is. And that's why we say Father. He says Daughter. Because there's nothing blocking you and God anymore. You have access to fellowship. 
You have access to him. You have access to answered prayers. You have, you have access to. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are his righteousness. Glory to God. Glory to God. We stand as Jesus stands before God. We have a right hand seat with God in Christ. God is obliged. Obliged. Is obligated towards you. Is obliged to answer your prayer as he would Jesus Christ. We all believe that if Jesus prays, God answers. Do you believe that if you pray, he answers? Ephesians 2, 13 to 15. Let's move close. Let's just move faster. All right, I need to say this. You can just write in Ephesians 2, 13 to 15. You can read that later. He said, from the Old Testament to the New, God's interaction with man has always been on the basis of blood. Right? Has always been on the basis of blood. And children of Israel, every, every time they needed to go to the temple, they had to carry bulls and goats and cut the covenant that God had with Abraham. He, he had to bring turtle doves and all of that. And it was caught. Do you understand? And so he entered into a relationship, a covenant relationship. God was looking for how to get into a relationship with man. And so he, he found a way through, through, eight, through, Ad, through um, Abraham. And through Abraham, by the cutting of the turtle doves, he entered into a covenant with him. It was not the perfect kind of covenant, but it would do because that was all that was allowed. Jesus had not come. And all through the Old Testament, the only reason God could relate with the children of Israel was because of blood, the, the blood of bulls and goats. Without blood, God could not reach them. Without blood, God could not, because the life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. Is that not why when it comes to marriage covenant, the blood is the same thing. When a man and a woman sleep together at a marriage, it is said they consummate the marriage because the life is in the blood. In a normal marriage scene, the woman and the man are supposed to be virgins. So when they come together, what happens? They cut a covenant and blood flows, right? When a virgin gets married, blood flows when she has intercourse with her husband. So what is that? They enter into a covenant relationship. And that's the way it is. When a man and a woman get married, if they've never slept together and they want to go their separate ways, it's not called divorce. It's called um, annulment because they have not entered the proper covenant together. You see how powerful sex is? Powerful. Pa it's a covenant. It's beyond all these casual things that people do about because they don't understand. It's power released, and that's why it's based on that covenant. And the Bible says one will chase a thousand, two will put ten thousand to flight. When a couple come together and they consummate their marriage and they stand together based on the, on the covenant that they have in God, listen to me, nothing can be withheld from them. And so Jesus came. You can check Hebrews chapter 9, verse 18 to 22. And so Jesus came. You know, the last part says, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there's no remission. But that was not God's perfect plan. Until Jesus came and became the sacrificial lamb that was slain from the foundation. And his blood was shed on the cross of Calvary. So that he obtained eternal redemption for us all. In such a way that we now have a free and living way to interact with God without end of war. When Jesus died, what happened? The, 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 the um, what do you call it now? The curtain in the temple tore from up to bottom. The Holy Ghost came out and rushed into men. That finally, and you know, was like, 
You know, you know how, how a child has been indoors and then you get home from work and then your child just runs out and hugs you. The Holy Ghost came and rushed into temples not made with hands. Human temples, the spirit of a man. Hebrews 9, 11 to 14. Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. Hebrews 10, 19 to 20 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way by which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and, and sin consciousness, and our bodies washed with pure water. And the last one, the name of Jesus. God gave us a name to use while on earth as our set of authority, all right, as his representative here on earth. And that's the name of Jesus in prayer. That's why when we call that name in prayer, oh my God, heaven and hell must obey. Mark 16, 17, 20 said, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. In my name. The name of Jesus in prayer is not a starting point and an ending point. Okay, so in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, what does that mean? Like round off, round off, round off. We abuse that name in the name of Jesus. So that's like, say, okay, now let's bring the prayer to a close in the name of Jesus. No, you need to understand the power in the name. If you don't understand the power in the name, you can't experience the power in the name. All right. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and said, all authority has been given to me. Now go therefore and make disciples. That is, go in my name and make, a dis and make disciples. All right? And that's very important. Ephesians chapter 2, 11, 13, 11 to 13. It goes on and on. But let, let me just, because I need to go. Jesus got a superior name that was superior to every other name. Remember when John wanted to pray for and Peter and John wanted to pray for the man at the beautiful gate. What did they say? They said, you know, silver and gold I don't have. But what I have, I give to you. In the name. You need to understand and do a study of the name. In the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. When they began to harass them, the Pharisees and those in authority. And they said, why should you heal a man on Sabbath day and all of that? And, and, you know, and, and they said, faith in the name of Jesus healed this man. Faith in the name of Jesus healed this man. Philippians 2, 9 to 11 says, Therefore God also has exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. God, Jesus got his name on three accounts, by inheritance. Hebrews 1, 4. Having become so much more better than the angels, as he has, been, as, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And so he got it by inheritance. He inherited the power, the authority in that name. He got it by confirmment. All right, Philippians 2, 9. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and has given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And it goes on. And thirdly, by conquest. He got that name by conquest. Like no other name. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made an open show of them, triumphing over them in it. So he had to go to hell to obtain that name. And that's why when that name is mentioned, Satan remembers how he got that name in hell. Satan remembers how he embarrassed him in hell. And that's why all of hell has to bow at the name of Jesus. That's why when you're praying for people and you say, in the name, you need to be conscious of the power that is backing up that name, that when I call that name, something happens. Because it's not an ordinary name like we have. It's not an, he got that powerful name on three counts. By inheritance, by conferment, and by conquest. And that's why we can be rest assured that when we pray in the name of Jesus, it is done. It is done. Glory to God.
John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear fruit and your fruit should abide or remain. And whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. So the name of Jesus is like a scepter of authority. You know how kings, if you invite a king royalty somewhere and he can't go, he will send his scepter. Whoever carries the scepter gets the same honor the king would have, would have gotten if he was there. Do you understand what I mean? The name of Jesus is a spiritual scepter that whenever the name of Jesus is mentioned, the same honor, the same respect, the same as if Jesus were there himself will be given to you. The same way Jesus will cast out demons and demons will beg. That same way when you say in the name of Jesus. You see the same way demons have to flee. So let's go finally to praying in the spirit. I'm trying to just quickly, quickly rush everything. Praying in the spirit. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18. How do we pray? Yes, we pray, we pray and all, but you see, there's a more superior way of praying. There's a more superior way of praying. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. And it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication. How? How? In the spirit. Praying always. With all prayer and supplication in the spirit. We know there are different kinds of, of prayer. Prayer of faith, prayer of supplication, prayer of thanksgiving and all of that. But he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And this is why we pray in tongues. When we say pray in the spirit, we, we're talking about praying in tongues. In, um, in Luke chapter, in the last chapter of Luke, chapter 24, verse 49, it says, Tarry in Jerusalem, Jesus, after he had risen and, and he appeared to the disciples. It said, Tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. That is, don't you dare try to go out to do the work of the ministry in the flesh. You can't do the work of the ministry in the flesh. You need an empowerment. It says, tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Right? In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says, and you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then you'll become witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea. Um, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. That is, you shall receive power means ability to cause change. You shall receive ability to cause change. And then you will become, the word witness means you'll become a proof producers. You'll become proof producers unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And in Acts chapter 2, the Bible starts, the scripture starts with on the day of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, the word Pentecost means harvest on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came. So the Holy Ghost is the Lord of the harvest. God sent the Holy Ghost to the, to, 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 to this world to bring in the harvest of souls and to bring into birth revival. And he came, it says, Jesus told them, he says, you will soon be, he said, he said, John the Baptist came baptizing with water, but you see, so when the Holy Ghost comes on, you will be baptized with fire. You will be baptized with fire. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came, the day of harvest, the Holy Ghost came. And when the Holy Ghost came, they were all filled with tongues and with all filled with the spirit. Cloven tongues of fire came upon all of them. They began to speak in tongues. And from that point onwards, they continued. They began. That began the revolution of praying in the Holy Ghost. Listen to me. In Luke chapter 3, the Bible says Jesus went to John the Baptist to get baptized by water. Jesus was the first to get baptized by the Holy Ghost. So he went, when he got there, John Baptist said, no, I can't, you know, I'm not worthy to tie a shoelace and just a suffer it to be so for now. And that's why people need to learn authority. No matter how anointed you are, you have to be under authority. Jesus was under authority of John the Baptist and said, suffer it to be so for now. 
baptized me. And he bowed down, and as John the Baptist, ba baptizer, or John the Baptist baptized him, what happened? The heavens opened. The Holy Ghost came in the form of a dove and landed on him, and Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. Somebody said, how do I know that? Because in Luke chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible says it was led into the wilderness by the Spirit to pray. For 40 days and 40 nights. Also, um, Acts chapter 10 verse 38 also says something. It says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with what? With the Holy Ghost and with power. Who went about doing good. Healing all those afflicted of the devil. Why? Because the Lord was working with him. Because God was with him. How Jesus of Nazareth. You see, before Jesus got baptized with the Holy Ghost and with power, he was not called the Christ. He was called Jesus of Nazareth. But after he got baptized with the Holy Ghost, he was called Jesus Christ because the word Christ is not the surname of Jesus. The word Christ simply means the anointed one and his anointing. So G Christ is not the surname of Jesus. Christ is just what, he, what happened to him. He got anointed. So he became Jesus, the anointed one. And based on the fact that he was the anointed one, that qualified him to do the works of, of, the, to do the works of God. To heal the sick, to cast out demons, to raise the dead. Are you anointed? Have you received the Holy Ghost? You know, we have, we have reduced the Holy Ghost to praying in tongues. Are you filled with the Holy Ghost? Yes, I pray in tongues. And that's all. Like, oh, that means the manifest. You see, the speaking in tongues is just the manifestation of the presence of the Holy Ghost inside you. Is the beginning. So the question now is why is the Holy Ghost inside you? To win souls. Because he came for the harvest. To pray revive for revival fire. To heal the sick. To do the works of Jesus. Jesus said the works that I do. The same shall you do. And even more because I go to the father. He said I will send another paracletos. Another just like me. That will be with you. But this one can be in many of you at the same time, like I can be in all of you at the same time. And the Holy Ghost began to manifest himself from the moment that he came to the earth. The Holy Ghost came once and for all. He has been on the earth since the day of Pentecost. He has not gone back. And you see, the first manifestation of the Holy Ghost was speaking in tongues. The second was what? Evangelism. And Peter went and preached. And 3,000 souls were added to the church. That was the advantage of the Holy Ghost at work in Peter. 3,000 souls were saved. Down the line, 5,000 souls were added to the church. Why? Because it's harvest time. Jesus said in Mark chapter, John chapter 4 verse 35, Do not say they are yet four months. He said, look around you, the harvest is, is already ripe. So we are in the midst of a harvest. We are in the midst of a revival. But you see, God requires revivalists to arise and to pray out the Holy Ghost and to pray out fire upon the earth. So Jesus said, you can't do the work of the ministry because he couldn't. If you read Luke chapter 4, the, the spirit that he received, the Holy Ghost he received in Luke chapter 3, led him into a place of of quietness so he could wait on God and spend time praying. If Jesus needed to pray. The Bible says in he was filled with the spirit in Luke chapter 3. In Luke chapter 4 verse 14. It says and he went forth in the power of the Holy Ghost. You see you when you get filled with the spirit you are filled. But it doesn't mean it doesn't mean you 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 have you need to use the tongue and use it and use it and use it until it is converted to power. You see what is going to take for you to fulfill your destiny is not being filled with the Spirit. It is being full of power. If Jesus needed to be full of power so that his glorious destiny can be engaged, because in verse fourteen the Bible says he went forth in the power of the Holy Ghost. And, you know, and his fame went far and abroad 
and the same temple he used to go to to read the to read the the scriptures and all. He went back, opened it, but this time it was different. They started to look at him strangely. He said, "Today is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing?" And what was that scripture? Isaiah chapter 61, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. And no, it, it said the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He could declare it boldly. He had read the, he had read Isaiah. He had read all those things before, but this time the fulfillment of that prophecy had come. He was full of the Holy ghost. He had received power and he went and read it. Isaiah chapter four, chapter 61. Um, the, 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 the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to, to, to open, to heal the sick, to open blind eyes, to preach the gospel to the poor and all of that. And he shot it closed the book and looked at them. I'm sure he smiled because Jesus was full of joy. You know, the Jesus of Nazareth, we all watched Jesus of Nazareth. was always melancholic and morose and looking sad and dull and stupid. You know, that look, that Jesus of Nazareth, look, that wasn't our Jesus. He was full of joy. He was the prince of joy himself. Remember when the disciples came and said, we heal the sick in your name, even demons. What did Bible say? The Bible says he rejoiced in the spirit. The real rendition of that word rejoice is he did a backflip. So you can imagine how playful Jesus was. He was so playful that John the Baptist, um, that, that John the, the disciple, will, you know, the, the beloved, will, will rest his head on Jesus' chest. And Jesus wasn't like, come on, you know. What are you doing? He loved children. He loved people. He was a, a lover. He was not a stern looking, you know, sadist. Glory to God. And so Jesus needed to get filled with the spirit and looked at them, probably smiled and said, today, this scripture has come, is fulfilled in your hearing. And they were mad. How dare he talk with so much authority? They didn't know he had power. That things had changed. That levels had changed. If you're going to change levels in the realm of the spirit, you've got to immerse yourself in prayer. You've got to condemn yourself to prayer. If Jesus needed to condemn himself in the place of prayer for 40 days and 40 nights, he wasn't just sitting there. He was praying. He was exercising the, the Holy Ghost that was inside of him. He was, he was, he was, he was building himself Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. If Jesus needed to get empowered for his destiny to be fulfilled, who are you? Who am I? We need empowerment. And it doesn't come cheap. You will pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. You've got to pray. And so prayer is not a joke. Prayer is a profession. Prayer is our, is our calling. Prayer is our life. Prayer is our full-time job. You pray all the time. So I pray always. I wish above, I wish, I wish that men will pray everywhere, lift up holy hands. You will pray. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. You will pray. You will, you, your life is prayer like you breathe. Your life is prayer. You only take a break to sleep. You take a break to go to work. You take a break to eat. You take a break to talk. Prayer is not something we do quiet time. What is quiet time? Prayer is a lifestyle. You pray all the time. You pray on the go. Glory to God. Tongues are a prayer language given to us by the Holy Spirit to communicate with God, to be empowered for life and ministry, and to call things forth from the spirit realm that are either heeding or do not exist in the natural. It is a coded family language of communication that completely excludes Satan and even our own renewed minds from divine transactions with heaven. You see, when we pray in tongues, we're making divine transactions in the spirit. And sometimes, you see, our peanut brains, our minds are too small to comprehend what God wants to do. If God will show you everything your life is about, my God, you may backslide. If God will show you where it's going, you'll be afraid to press in. But we live by faith. 
And so while you're praying, you think you're praying for, his, for your spouse, you think you're praying for, um, you know, a business contract, you know, in the spirit, you're praying something else. Lord, send me, Lord, send me to China, send me to Asia. That's what you're praying. You're praying for missionaries. You're praying for souls. You're praying for things that you don't know about. Write these scriptures down and go over them on your own. Isaiah 28, verse 11 to 12. Prophet Isaiah said, talking about, it says, with, 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 with stammering tongues, they will speak. Was prophesying about praying in tongues. Isaiah 28, 11 to 12. Luke 24, verse 49, I said that, tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power. Acts 1, 4, and 5, 4 to 5, and then verse 8. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 to the end. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and 4. Romans 8, 26 and 28. Read those scriptures. They are all about speaking in tongues and the power of praying in tongues. But I will just explain a few things. So why do we pray in tongues? How many minutes do I have left, please? Why do we pray in tongues? Because praying in tongues is the entrance into the supernatural. Praying in tongues is the entrance into the supernatural. Right? Acts chapter 1 verse 8. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Number 2. Praying in tongues is the true source of spiritual empowerment. It says, Tire in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And that's... um. Um, Luke 24, 49, tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. So that's, um, that's, uh, it, it is, it is a, it's a, it's a true source of spiritual empowerment. Number three, it aids the flow of revelation knowledge. When Paul began to pray the Pauline prayers, by the way, do you know the Pauline prayers? Do you know what is called the Pauline prayers? The Pauline prayers are the best way to pray in the new Testament. We don't pray for things in the New Testament. Why? Because, you see, we pray kingdom prayers in the New Testament. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and every other thing will be added. So we don't pray, God, give me something. God, give me that. No, that's baby prayer. That's for babies. Mature people don't, mature believers don't pray for their needs. Mature believers pray for the kingdom and God meets their needs. All right. So it says, it prays, it says that God will grant us the spirit of wisdom and revelation that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. That we may know the hope of his calling. Number four, it helps us to pray out the hidden secrets about our lives, future and purpose. First Corinthians 2.13. It helps us to pray out the perfect will of God for our lives, situations and others. Romans 8.26 to 28. It helps us grow spiritually. <clears throat> First Corinthians 14.4. It refreshes our spirits and our souls. Isaiah 28, 11 to, two, to 12. It stirs our faith. Jude 1, 20. It tames the tongue. James 3, 2. It helps us to intercede effectively. Ezekiel 22 to 30. Ooh, there's so much to do. There's so much to say, but I have to round off. I need to know how much time I have left. All right. Sorry, ma'am. I sent you a private chat. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. Um, can you resend? Oh, right. I got it. All right. Now, let me show you something. Let me show you something. Let's open our Bibles to First um, Corinthians chapter 2. So I want quickly, I have 10 minutes to go. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. And then we'll go to Romans 8, 26. And this will change your lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. And it says, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. It says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. So first of all, the Bible says, when you speak in tongues, what are you doing? What are you doing when you speak in tongues? You're speaking wisdom, right? 
You're speaking wisdom. We speak wisdom among those who are mature. All right. It says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, in a secret. The hidden wisdom with God ordained before the ages for our glory. So what is he trying to say? That God has hidden, that God has hidden the wisdom, not from us, but for us. Not from us, but for us. Many things about your life. When you pray in the spirit, you're praying out the wisdom of God concerning your life, your future. I tell people, some of us, our prayer lives are like behind so last season. Behind shadow. What do I mean by that? This is 2021. Some people's prayer lives are still in 2016 or 2009. And then you're wondering why you're just hitting brick walls and things are not going well. And you're not growing and all of, uh, all of that. And some, they have prayed to the point of their 2020. So it's still okay. But some have entered 2030. That's where you should be. You should pray ahead. Throw what pray, throw prayer power ahead of you so that doors just keep on opening. So that you're confidently entering into new realms. Every year you enter a new year, you're not afraid. You don't care what's going on. Why? Because you've prayed it out. That's the praying of the wisdom, the mysteries. He said, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Foolish devil. He thought killing Jesus was like, you know, I got the first Adam. I'm going to get the second Adam as well. But he didn't know the second Adam. God tricked him. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard. Now I've entered into the heart of and the thing that God has prepared for those who love him. You see, when it comes to your life, there are too many things in the depth of the spirit. Too many things hidden in the depth of the spirit. You don't even know yourself yet. I'm just beginning to know myself. You don't even know yourself yet. You only know what your father told you, what your mother told you, what your teacher told you. You only know what people have said to you and said about you. But you see, the real you is hidden in the spirit. Because you see, God doesn't put the best things on the surface. God puts the best things hidden. That's why real gold is not found like gravel. Gravel is everywhere on the surface and that's why it's worthless. But gold has to be dug in. Oil cannot be found like water. Oil has to be dug. You need to be skillful and drill and drill and drill and drill and drill until you hit the gusher. Are you with me? That's why private parts are not on our faces for everybody to see. And, you, know, you know what I mean? That's why it's hidden under so that the man that will find it must deserve it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the precious things in life are not on the surface. When it comes to your life, the best of you is not in the flesh. It's not in this body. The best of you is not in your soul. The best of you is hidden in your spirit, man. And that's why I said, but God, verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now, verse 12, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. And these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. He said, but he who is spiritual judges all things. It goes on and on. And so you see, those things are inside you that is going to take you committed to praying in the spirit. It's going to take you spending time praying and praying and praying to dig up the resources. Listen to me. The best of you is in the spirit. The best of you don't know yourself yet. I tell somebody says, I know my calling. I know. I said, how long have you prayed? You don't know you yet. You can't know you because the real you is not on the surface. The real you is not what I see. Your real calling for your calling to be harnessed. You've got to go deep inside to find the
the real you that is trapped deep down in your spirit, man. Listen to me. It goes beyond your academic excellence. It goes beyond your mind. It goes beyond your being a female. It goes beyond what the eyes can't see, who you really are, who you truly are. The resources that God has planted in your spirit, man, your calling cannot be drawn except through prayer. Look at a person like Apostle Babalola. I just love that guy. Why? Because you see, the guy was a truck driver. He had no hope, naturally speaking. He couldn't even speak English. But he knew how to pray. And he prayed and prayed until he touched the gush of his calling. Until his calling had to burst forth. An illiterate man that a university was in his calling. Kabbalah Satalaba. He had a university in his calling, in his spirit, man. That it be without be entering into the depth of his calling, he would never, he was an illiterate. He couldn't speak English all his life until he died. He couldn't speak English. And yet there were universities in his spirit, man. What is in your spirit, man? What are you carrying about? And you see, that's why I wonder when women throw themselves, you know, you cast your pearls before swine because you don't know who you are. You get married to a man that cannot understand your calling, understand the weight of the glory of God that you carry a man that will judge you by how well you can cook and how well you can sweep and how well you can clean the baby's bomb bomb that your real worth to a man is what you can do in the flesh you see the real your real worth is not in the flesh your real worth is who you are in the spirit it's who you are in the spirit you don't know how loaded you are and that's why we pray long hours that's why we incubate the spirit of God. Because your spirit man knows the truth about your life. Your spirit man knows everything about you. And you see, but you see, you need to decode it. And you pray in the spirit and you pray and you pray. Things that no eye has seen. Things that no ear has heard. Things that have never entered into the heart of any man. That God has in store for you. You can never find it on the surface. You can never find it lying down on the surface. You've got to go deep. To dig it up. And that's why we pray, Lord, let every resource within me be stirred up. Your calling for my life, what you have planted inside of me, the resources that you have placed within me, I stir it up right now. And that's why I say, you see, when you understand these things, you realize that prayer is more than by God, give me Gucci bag. You realize that prayer is not for asking God for things. There are more important things. It's about destiny. It's a platform for empowerment. It's to stir up and awaken the giant that is within you. Let's quickly see and we round off on this note in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. And it says, likewise, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses. Except for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. Now, when you understand that, you see... I pray in tongues all the time. All the time. Like, I don't pray in my understanding. If I pray in my understanding, I'm, praying, I'm speaking the word. Listen, God doesn't understand English, like I said. God doesn't need your opinion. God doesn't speak. He only speaks his word. And so if I'm communicating with God, I either communicate in the spirit, by the spirit, or I communicate his word. Father, I thank you because you said this in your word. Then he hears. Father, I thank you because. Or I, and, then, and then I go ahead and pray in the spirit. And that's why I pray in the spirit long hours. And that's why we can do that. There's a secret we do. It's called pray as you go. Pray as you go. P-A-Y-G. Pray as you go. And that's how you can pray 17 hours in a day. That's why I can pray 20 hours. That's why my people do it. Because from the moment you wake up, you need to be intentional if you're going to be a prayer person. You need to be very intentional. For Jotham became mighty because he prepared his ways before the Lord is God. 2 Chronicles chapter 27 verse 6. You've got to be intentional. And so prayer is not a religious thing. Like, okay, you know. All right, so let me round off. So it said, likewise, the spirit helps in our weaknesses. That word weakness is not, um, you know, pain, sickness. But what it means is likewise, the spirit helps in our inability to produce results. Your greatest problem is not what is going on in the flesh. 
It says it helps our inability to produce results. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought in your understanding. You don't know what to pray for. You only know right now. You don't know the next five minutes. You don't know tomorrow. You don't know next year. You don't know what's going on outside of this room where we are. But the Holy Ghost does. And that's why we pray in the spirit. So I was talking about pray as you go. From the moment you wake up, you start praying and tell you, I want to do six hours today. So stop praying. From the moment you wake up, you go to the bathroom. Blah, 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 blah. In fact, let your mouth wake up before your eyes wake up. Stop praying in the spirit. And then you wake up your eyes, you get up. You're brushing. You have your back, you're praying in the Holy Ghost. You're praying, you can play music, you can play messages, you can play whatever. I pray our prayer chain. We call it the prayer chain. So I just play the prayer chain, just wakes you up because there's somebody praying there that just, you know, just pray, have your bath or whatever. You get ready for work. You're still praying in tongues. You're taking care of the children. You know, stop it. Take your hands away. It's not spoiling anything. Do you understand? You're cooking. You're going to wait outside. You're doing all you're doing. You're driving to work. Usually, if you live in Lagos, maybe about one hour to get to work or more instead of complaining about the traffic turn it into another prayer studio continue praying before you know you're at work under your breath nobody needs to know you're praying and thank god for the mask now so it makes it better for us you know what i mean now it makes it better because nobody knows what's going on behind the mask not because we're afraid of covid but it's another opportunity to pray in tongues Nobody needs to know. Before you know, you've done six straight hours. Before you know, you've done 10 hours, especially when you're conscious. Go for your meetings. After your meetings, continue praying in the Holy Ghost. Just keep staring yourself all through the day. Keep on praying. Praying always. Praying always without prayer and supplication. So it says, for we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. With groanings which cannot be uttered. Verse 27. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is. Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. But if you check your Bible, you realize the will of is in italics. Meaning it was not in the original rendition. So that means if you take out the will of God, the will of is going to give any time, anywhere in the scriptures... Where you see italics, just understand it was not there at the beginning. And so it, may, it means this way, because it makes intercession for the saints according to God. So when you pray in tongues, how you pray? According to God. So it is God saying, lend me your tongue so that I can pray for you my will. How perfect do you think that prayer can be? And that's why verse 28 is a continuation of 26 and 27 because the Bible was not written in, chur- in chapters and verses. It was, written to- it was written together. So you can't understand a text except to check the pretext, the post text. You check it all. So what happens? You look at it, verse 20 is a continuation of verse 26 and 27. And it says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So you can't separate 28, meaning if you're not spending time praying in tongues, 28 is not for you. So 28 is the result of 26 and 27. Do you understand? And that's why when we pray in tongues a lot, oh my God, you're stirring up things inside of you, stirring up your calling, you're growing You're growing, you're brooding. He that prays in a known tongue edifies himself, builds up himself. First first Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. Builds up himself like an edifice. You know, charges up himself like a battery. Builds up himself like an edifice. Charges up himself like a battery. We edify ourselves when we pray in tongues. And we make great power available. According to James chapter 5, verse 6. Is it 16? It says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. I want us to just pray just for a minute before we move to the next level. Just go ahead and let's just pray in the spirit. 
And we're going to pray this way. We're going to say, Holy Spirit, I yield myself to you. I receive, I contact right now the impartation of prayer. Impartation to live my life in prayer. Impartation to wait on God in fastings and in prayer. Impartation, oh God, to do long hours prayer. Let the anointing come upon me. Let me be a carrier of the same anointing so that everybody around me contacts the same anointing. Come on, say in the prayer and pray and say, Lord, things that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, things that have never entered into the heart of any man that you have in store for me, O oh God. Pray and say, Lord, I stir up the gift of God within me. I stir up, come on, put your hands on your belly and pray and say, Lord, I stir up the gift of God within me. I stir up every potential of God within me. I stir up the resources of God inside of me. I stir up my calling in the name of Jesus. All that I can be, all that I was born to be, your plans and your purpose, Lord. I stir them all up right now as I yield to the Holy Spirit to pray out his perfect plan. Lambra da Gadosa, Talian, the Sombre di Ecatosa, Engra Bayan, the Limbra di Ecatosa, the Nambre di Ecatosa, Rede de Boshata, Rede de Bosha, Tali Bracabala Dosa, Redo Shatalianda. I stir it up in the name of Jesus. Maliando sombradia, mambregedia ketosa. Let there be an awakening within me in the name of Jesus. Let there be an awakening, oh God. A new move of the spirit in my spirit, oh God. Lambradia ketosa la dosa. Let the giant within me arise. Let destiny be birthed in the name of Jesus. Let my calling, oh God, come forth in the name of Jesus. Maliando sombra di ecotol sala nombra di a Mambre gedi ecotoliando sombra de gedosha Lambra gadi ecotol salianda Father, we give you the praise and glory, O God. Father, we give you the praise and the glory, O God. Lord, we pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. In the knowledge of you, O God, let the eyes of our understanding be enlightened. In the name of Jesus, I pray, O God, for strength in the inner man. Lord, strength to live a life of prayer. A life that is de- dedicated to prayer. A life that is condemned to prayer. Prayer in the name of Jesus. Mandoliam Bragadiesh Tolianda. Father, we give you the praise and glory. Oh, Holy Spirit, I pray. Let there be an impartation of grace. Let there be an impartation, oh God, of the Spirit. The Spirit of prayer. Let it rest upon everyone. Let it rest upon everyone. The same anointing, the same token. Let it rest upon them, oh God. As the laborer within them arises and they go forth into their world to change their world and to stir up revival fire in their world in the name of Jesus in the continents of the earth. Lord, we give you praise and glory in Jesus mighty name. Amen. 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 Amen.